Nice. So, yep. Okay. This film up here that just for the new music show here. It's the Youth Channel. Yeah. It's the performance of Canada's MTV, right? Yeah. Okay. With, jur with journalism, which is how we <laughs> like to paint it. <laughs> MTV with a few questions. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Where's it wrong? Sweet. Um, MTV with questions. With questions, fact. yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's I didn't say going. that. <laughs> It'll, it won't make the edit. Um, refocused. Last few albums. Did you sit down and talk to yourself and just refocus what you were doing? I really go in from project to project. Uh, and I don't often take stock. Uh, I think that helps me make ghastly mistakes, which is really quite good. Um, I think if you don't make mistakes, you never really reach to the really high points and really good points. I think the reason that occasionally I come up with something that's really quite good is because I allow myself to make an absolute fool of myself, enough to come across good things in, in doing that. And you exist in a genre and in, a, in an industry where People expect things of you that they wouldn't even expect from their closest friends, which is you're not allowed to have a, pe a valley or, in, or even a plateau. You have to peak always. <laughs> well, also, I think people are okay about me making mistakes, <laughs> That's what, which is even better, because now I've got a tried and true method of working. Uh, people, so I know when I say people, I actually mean my, my core group of uh, audience, you know, who are really very loyal. I mean. I've consistently sold the same amount of albums for decades now. Mm -hmm. It's like they've really been there for me. And I, and I, I can hear them going, oh, when's he going to get over this period and move into... And that, but it's okay, but they'll, they'll wait for me to kind of figure out what it is I'm doing. Well, when someone says, oh, it's Bowie. That's it's kind of like that, yeah. <laughs> Which can be an incredible freedom thing, but quite a crutch if you wanted it to be. Yeah, I know. So the, I don't feel the pressure too much. All I do feel, the only pressure I f feel on it is to do the best that I possibly can at any given time, which I think, I, 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 I hold that as a premise for every artist anyway. I think they should always do the very best um, uh, of what they can do at that given time. And it's not always the case. Uh, one can be tempted to glide along, you know, which is not a good thing. Has that ever happened to you? Yeah, I think. The yielding uh, to the temptation. Yeah. I, I do. I mean, uh, you know, I had a very bad 80s. Uh, actually, I think everybody had a very bad 80s, didn't they? I particularly did. Uh, specifically from around 84 through till 80, late 88. That, those four years, in fact. Which is, actually, looking back on my career, I, that, I was pretty lucky. I mean, that wasn't so bad. I know artists that have been through much rougher periods or keep coming back to rough periods. But for me, that was just awful. It was. Uh, just the worst. Um, and I, I lost all confidence in what I was doing. And, uh, and I hated what I was doing, actually. Quite quietly to myself. I didn't tell anybody else around me that I, I didn't think I was doing very good work. Specifically, because it was selling really well, which is really embarrassing, you know, when the best things that you, that would mean like <laughs> these, you know, albums that you don't really think much of in, are incredibly big sellers. And it's like, oh, Christ. Is that why you decided to do a tour to put those songs to bed? Well, it's, it was all cumulative, yes. I mean, you know, a lot of things happened. Uh, I found my exit from all that mainstream stuff through Tim Machine. I mean, that was my sort of my holy grail at the time. It was, ah, this is the truth. This, this, this will help take me back to what it was I liked about music in the first place. And indeed it did. However, uh, inelegant it looked from the outside. It actually worked for me as uh, a vehicle for getting back to uh, my, own, my own personal standards of writing and, and, and producing and all that. So I think it was one of the better things that I did. And to follow through from that, I, I've, I've actually liked an awful lot of what I've done in the 90s. I, I'm really proud of that work. I did some very good work in the 90s. It's, it's, a lot of it is really quite interesting. Um, uh, it's conceived well, and uh, I think it gave a lot of people a lot of amusement. <laughs> uh, uh, it's good stuff to look back on. And I find that I, I must like it because I keep going back to it to draw songs from it to put in the shows, so I know I like it. I know I like it, because uh, 
I'm not drawing much from the uh, 84, 88 period. <laughs> 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 you know, but I have got Hello Space Boy and uh, I'm Afraid of Americans and the odd thing, you know, that comes up from the uh, from that period in the 90s. Did you see the out when you were in that period? Did you did you see, I can get through this? No, um, not really. I mean, right in the middle, well, towards the end, yeah, 88, it started to come together. Meeting uh, the guitar player, Rhys Gabrels, really sort of changed everything around in that way. But in the middle of it, no, I mean, I seriously thought about painting and, and taking up that again, you know, which is the other thing I was doing when I was a kid, painting and sculpting, and I thought, well, you know, I could always be a visual artist then and uh, <laughs> go back to the uh, plastic arts uh, and try that or something maybe, but uh, I can't seriously think that I actually really thought that, but I think superficially I thought that. I really do. But that helps make you what you are. I mean, fear is a big part of this oh, record, absolutely. but it's a big part of a lot of stuff you've done. You know, fear is so important. Uh, the trouble with the Western ethic is that we're encouraged to uh, negate every kind of disappointment in our lives. We're told that fear and pain and all those things are things that we can overcome or avoid or kind of, you know, if we're, we're in touch with this kind of spiritual life, we won't ever have those things in our lives. And of course, I think they're terribly important. I think the pain uh, and the disappointments and all that are so much uh, a foundation of making us stronger as people, that I think we have to embrace them as much as we embrace happiness or the need for happiness and all that. Um, so maybe I do dwell on those aspects of life quite a lot in my albums. They are darker, they are kind of so. I'm not really that kind of guy at all though, I'm, you know. I'm not Trent. <laughs> I, I'm really quite, I'm not that serious. I'm not that dark all the time. I'm actually quite a buoyant personality. But I think left to my own devices, that 2 a.m. moment in the early morning, um, all these questions and all that questioning comes into play. You never, should never be alone with yourself that it's much. It's kind of like that, yeah. <laughs> My mind's a bad neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Waits popped into this interview. <laughs> <laughs> stuff. Kind of gets like that. So because you can be buoyant and happy yeah. throughout your day, yeah. you can go deeper to the stuff that comes out on I, this. I do tend to, yeah. When I'm writing, I really, it's a, it's a different part of me that I kind of reach into, to, you know. And a lot of it is uh, inevitably about the construction of our, uh, of our lives and why we create values and what is morality and, and are all these just kind of, are they, are they self structures that we create to give ourselves a reason for living? I mean, is, is the reality that there is no morality? Mm -hmm. I mean, which is kind of scary because that means there's no reason for life, in which case, why do we bother? And, oh, no, I hate that. Oh, I don't want to go there. You know, and, and, but you do. You keep confronting that all the time. I do, anyway. You ever feel alone? Yeah. We all feel very alone, don't we? Often. Too often. That's why we make such a thing of trying to be with people and become social animals. It's very scary to know that uh, <coughs> those last moments will be absolutely alone. Uh, the other side of the coin is whatever questions you had about what happened will be answered shortly. That's right, so why bother posing them now? I mean, if you know, I'll, maybe I should be a Zen Buddhist and then I can get rid of all that. It's too much attention to it, detail. It is, isn't it? <laughs> it's very hard work being having no mind. <laughs> um, your fans generally pleased with the period you're in now. Because I get the impression they're really quite chuffed, yeah. I think they like what I'm doing. It's a balance yeah. between elegance, it's a balance between your, what you've done in your career yeah. with you know, being able to play with Busta Rhymes and have it work. Yeah, I, I know, that's a, he's a hell of a guy. He's, uh, Has he taught you anything about this industry? <laughs> Well, that you can skive off gigs every now and again, yeah. <laughs> it's a different he's relationship. A good, no, he's a really cracking guy. I like him a lot. He's got a, a great sense of humor. And he's very hearty. He's kind of huge and huggy. And, and uh, uh, I like him a lot. He's a great guy. I like all the people on this tour. They're really nice people. It's, it's been able to make a festival audience in North America see things that they would see in the north of England. 
that never happened in America before. Not That's like that. very true. It is very true. I mean, we, we do have the equivalent of this kind of festival all the time in Europe. I've been playing festivals, actually, with my band. Every summer I have tried, up until my baby was born, I was doing festivals every year, you know. And I, we used to adore them. I mean, we love them. And because the range and the diversity of artists, uh, you can get everything from a cartoonist to prodigy to myself to uh, all on the same bill. It doesn't ostensibly make sense. But the, uh, the, it, it's because of that diversity, it kind of gels with the audience. And the audience realize their own potential for having an open-mindedness that maybe they didn't even know they had before. And they're taking all these things in. And I, this works, it does work in the same way. Uh, I can see even on my own message boards and my fan site, the, how encouraged they are by saying, I never thought I was going to like Ash or, the, you know, or Buster. What do I know about Buster? No, I really enjoyed him. He was so energetic and blah, blah, blah. And they're liking new kinds of music, you know. So it's nothing but healthy. Every it's guitar, really good. Every guitar, of course, has been played, so you can't really kind of do like something that. different with a guitar. Oh, God, you're going postmodernist, aren't you? <laughs> you can, but there's a way to do it now. There's a way to <laughs> All be... originality <laughs> is over. It'll never happen again. Yeah. Nothing new will ever be done again. Stroke of luck, maybe. Oh, stroke of luck. But what you might be able to do is extend... Oh, thing as luck. No? Happy coincidence? Yeah. <laughs> What you can do, you can be groundbreaking by introducing people to other people. And I personally have loved doing that. When I was a kid, uh, I was always prided myself on being the kid on the block that knew everything about new artists first. And uh, I was so, you know, I heard a friend of mine came back from America and brought me back. He'd been, he'd met up with Andy Warhol in New York and he brought me back a vinyl disc. He said, yeah, Warhol. Gave me, I said, I said, this band's rubbish. He said, but you might, you like weird stuff, you know. And he gave it to me. It was the Velvet Underground first album, and it hadn't been released in America. And I, within a week, I was doing waiting for the man with my band <laughs> before the Velvet Underground <laughs> album was even out. <laughs> that was your song. I mean, that's been fast. <laughs> <laughs> is that cool or what? So, and I loved doing things like that. I loved introducing new people to, you know, my friends and, and all that. Because I didn't have an audience then. So it was just friends. And I said, oh, this great new band, uh, Velvet Underground, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's cool to do that. It's nice. I don't know why it's nice, but it is. Well, because you can be friendly and challenging at the same is time. Is that what it is, or is it so. just kind of arrogance? You it's know what? Kind of we rationalize in North America. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's friendly and it's it's a. It's elitist. <laughs> yeah, maybe a little That's, bit. It's okay. But that's music. Right? Yeah, I guess. Trying to explain something that that is just usually a passion chord. <coughs> do you do you, you get to challenge your audience and they get to go with you along? Yeah. On the whole trip, and sometimes it works. And like you said, sometimes yeah. it doesn't work. Um, when it works, have you got your Maslow's high, uh, you know self actualization? <laughs> on that stage at that moment? Uh, when it does work, I think, funnily enough, the one thing it does do is, is set me up for wanting to change again. When things work, I kind of want to leave them alone because it's like point proved. It's like, if I do this and this and I create this situation and then it's accepted, then it, I find, well, okay, that's been validated. Uh, now I can move on. So, I, so that's why I probably I tend to grasshopper about because I, I, I don't often stay with something which seems to have been successful. And I, I don't understand if it's, if it's just perverse of me or, or if it really is an unrelenting need to do something else. Is I suppose it must be a mixture of the two. It could be validated. Um. Yeah, but I don't need to be continually validated. You know what I mean? I'm not hungry to be told, you know, oh, that's, so I much prefer to get on with things. Do you want to be the underdog? No, I don't think so. Although I think it's a far more romantic place to be. Yeah. It really is, isn't it? Then on top of it all, <laughs> I don't really want to be on top of it all. It'd be so boring, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, because then you're really not allowed to make mistakes. What does <laughs> New York mean to you? Because uh, it's not just a town. I, because of that blessed uh, documentary on New York, I keep thinking of it as a once mountainous terrain that was flattened and then gridded. <laughs> and a very clever series of canals which enabled the rest of the Americas to be opened up fully to exploitation. That's what I think of as my image of New York 
but that's from come watching too many documentaries. Um, okay, well, I think it's probably, uh, in one way, the worst place to live because it's no, it's so unrelenting. Um, the energy level is beyond belief. And I think you probably feel at the end of the day that you're not really actually getting any kind of relaxation there at all. You can't switch off. On the other hand, I adore that. I'm, it's sort of, I'm addicted to that. I like, the, I like the feeling that all around me life is going on fully and uh, at 100 miles an hour as it hits the ground. Uh, the bit that I'm in is not quite maybe as uh, high energy as that because it's more kind of downtown, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you get coupled with that layer of energy. You have the, you have this kind of uh, veneer of community on top of that. So there's a, a kind of a friendly feeling down there as well. And it just came out of such an incredible sadness. Yeah, sure did. Is there... Is there an upside there now? Do you see yeah, this Yeah, it'll grow again. I mean, uh, I was uh, in a little Italian restaurant the day before, yesterday actually, when we were back in New York. And it was sad that he was saying that they were thinking of selling up because they never got their customers back, you know. And that's just a tiny indication of some of the tragedy, tragedy, tragedy of, uh, of life around there, especially in Chinatown, unfortunately, where business has really taken a hard knocking. And I think a lot of people are hurting badly. And it's not really all coming back as fast as they thought it was. And of course, the interesting thing is that there's much talk of building another huge complex where the old towers were. Um, but none of the businesses want to buy back into it again. So that they all moved over to New Jersey and whatever, you know, and said, hey, hold on, we're really quite happy over here in New Jersey. I don't think we want to move back again, so. It's the Sopranos, they were the great tourist attraction for it Jersey. Is. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, let's, let's, I want to ask you about this industry. Um, the record labels have been completely unable to keep up. <laughs> they, they, things changed so quickly, it rained in the desert, no one had umbrellas. That's right. And <laughs> do, you That's funny. do you think they can? There's, there's no file sharing. Kids have voted smarter than them again. They have, yeah. I guess hopefully they will do continually. Uh, well, you know, I know so little about the record industry. Uh, all I know is that I see it really huffing and puffing. But you know a lot about the internet and how kids. Get I know a bit about there. the internet, and I think the internet will win through. It's un that's unstoppable. Uh, it does provide the wave of distribution for the future. I mean, you know, long live broadband. I, <coughs> I've caught your cough. <laughs> um, I, I presume that when broadband really takes, um, uh, ha when it has roots throughout the West, it, it is virtually over for a lot of industries, not just the record industry. I think the film industry is going to suffer terribly when you can really and easily download movies. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to, all our ideas of, of uh, uh, conveyance are going to change considerably when that happens. The crack in North America, you needed radio for the longest time, and radio yeah. has been in the power, in the hands of these, you know, 52 year old white guys who were from an era that didn't, before radio. And also, of course, monopolies. You yeah. can't rule out the fact that uh, over a thousand stations are owned by one conglomerate, you know. I mean, this is like. And the promoter. Uh, yeah, and it's, and it's, you know, it's very hard to work out how you provide an individual. The mom and pop station, I think, actually doing quite well again because they find they can change their formats easily. Mm -hmm. There are very, very few stations now where the, uh, the manager of the station, the guy that picks the records to be played on the radio, goes with a gut feeling anymore. Mm -hmm. That's over. Nearly every record that gets played on radio is decided upon by focus groups. And a four second call out. Where they phone listeners and ask them if they know or c can recognize 10 seconds of this song. And if they can, then that thing goes into the playlist. And if they can't, it doesn't go into the playlist. It's the most absurd McDonaldization <laughs> of, of uh, the Americas.
So Ziggy's been in people's consciousness for 30 years, and your future career <laughs> relies on somebody in Omaha and what they think of five <laughs> seconds of slow burn. Yeah, it's got to suck for you, man. I know. Well, I, you know, for many years, I've existed on word of mouth. I mean, uh, I'm actually, I'm finding that works for me very well because of the nature of my particular fan base. It's, uh, they're kind of weird internet-y people anyway, and so it, it has worked for me, and I, I, I don't have a problem with it. I mean, Heathen has done so incredibly well uh, throughout the world. Um, and in England, where I've had no radio play whatsoever, uh, it's, uh, it's been put into what's called the Mercury nominations, which mm -hmm. is a, it's kind of a, I don't know how to describe it. I suppose it's supposed to be the best of what's new each year. It's kind of a Grammys, but not really like Grammys. It's, it's not as mainstream music. as that. It's for important music. Yeah, I guess I suppose that's what it is. Um, and I was absolutely flabbergasted that with absolutely no play whatsoever, this thing has kind of, you know, been recognized as being a reasonable piece of work, which proved to me yet again that things like the internet mm -hmm. uh, work very well for me and that you can sort of you can get your stuff out there and, and have it known, you know. Of course, it's very, it's challenging in this country because you don't really have an outlet to get anything played on. So you have to hope that one person will tell the next person, you know, it really, that, that album's worth listening to. What else do you do, you know? I'll wrap on this question then. So that's been recognized. You're happy, things are going well, which yeah. means it's time to kill this puppy <laughs> and do something else. It does sound a bit like that, doesn't it? Yeah, interpretive dance, I thought. Might be. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, man. <laughs> my next, that might be my next phase. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfect end. Thank you. My pleasure. Love it all. <laughs>